start with this. Uh, uh, that's an indigo bunting. It's in a, obviously a sunflower field up in Habersham County. Um, the farm is owned by a friend of mine, a fellow Georgia Tech grad who spent his life in the oil industry. And I guess it's kind of a redeeming is the thing with his life now. He's been turning his old family farm back into sustainable uh, crops. And he uses sunflower seeds in order to do a crop rotation that brings in uh, the birds and other, particularly insects. And he puts that in, in the cycle. And he's kind enough to let me go there and take pictures. And you'll see a couple more as we go forward. Um, just a very, very little bit about me. And I was explaining this to, to Cindy. And I guess one of the reasons I missed kindergarten, I was in the woods somewhere. And um, my entire life growing up, I have spent as much of it as I can outdoors. In the early years, it was a lot of time with my father uh, fishing and a little bit of small game hunting. And those experiences and ability to feel comfortable in the outdoors and to be stealthy and a number of other things um, has carried forward into my birding and I think has helped me get some of the shots that you're going to see because I can get close to the bird, the bird feels comfortable. And I'm also going to and, and make a point that everything I do, I try to do it within the ethical bounds of the Nature Photography Association. So um, don't harass them, don't scare them, don't pull them off nests, don't do the kinds of things that would disrupt their everyday lives and put them in any sort of danger. I used uh, this great egret as an example because it's the National Audubon Society's uh, symbol. And the reason it's the symbol is because in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, uh, they nearly went extinct because of plumage hunting and also the draining of our wetlands. That was a large time in, in our history where we thought uh, wetlands were totally unproductive wastelands. And so we set about draining them, including the Everglades, which is where I spent a lot of my time camping and, and, and fishing with my, with my dad, uh, south of Orlando, Lake Kissimmee into the upper Everglades. Um, and at that time, uh, at night, you could still hear panthers scream uh, and so forth. And it was only because uh, there was this kind of awakening in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and they started um, protecting uh, wildlife and it went on to become the Endangered Species Act. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later too. My spark bird for my photography, because I've always had a camera with me to, to take pictures of when I've been doing things, hiking, fishing, and so forth. But I got a little serious in my late 20s and then uh, visiting all Benny uh, with my mom in her assisted living facility, uh, she would ask me to go over and make sure her red birds were taken care of at her feeders. And so I went over, took a picture, brought it back and um, shared it with her, framed it, and it moved immediately in front of me and next to the grandkids. And um, what I found was her neighbors really enjoyed it too. And it, it provided a connection for them back um, to a time and place when they were in their, in their homes. And so I started rotating uh, the pictures uh, through it. And um, that then um, got me started in this whole idea of sharing the photographs to bring nature closer to other people. And I put this one in here. Um, the, the male uh, Northern Cardinal gets a lot of the, the marquee time, but I think the female is every bit as attractive and, and, and maybe more so in her just simple elegance. They're, they're just gorgeous, gorgeous birds. Um, and I wanna go into this real, real quickly, because I think this group, um, probably fully understands this already, but there are a lot of benefits of birding because birding gets you outside and it gets you in nature and there's continuing in, in studies that are increasingly showing that just being in nature is good medicine. And um, one of the things that um, has been studied is just hearing birds can um, 
help you in terms of your mental your mental state. And um, I don't know if you can hear it over the leaf blower, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute too. Um, but there are birds, um, you know, chirping and singing around me right now. And over the last year, I, I'm I guess testimony that it it does help uh, relieve stress and some of the anxieties that we've been feeling as we've been sheltering in place. Um, it is a prescription for nature deficit disorder, a, a, a term coined by Richard Lewin. Um, it's not a true medical uh, disorder. It's not an ICDA-10 diagnosis code, but I really think it exists. I know I suffer it if I'm not outside uh, for some period of time. And also just getting closer to nature, you see the little nuances that I think just proves that God had a great sense of humor. I mean, can you look at this caliper bug's face and not just smile that that's that's a creation that was given to us um, and it just makes me happy sometimes when I see these um, so it's good medicine um, and I thought I'd go to our favorite university for a quote uh, for this group and here's Lisa Carlson some of you might know Lisa I've had a chance to work with her a couple of times just just a wonderful delightful person and she makes the point here, reiterating some of the studies, that just being outdoors at least 120 minutes a week can really make a difference um, in your mental mental health and in, in your overall well well being. Uh, this is a, a ruby throated hummingbird. Um, one of one of just about everybody's favorites, you know, to watch hummingbirds. And if you watch hummingbirds in your yard. Um, it's, it, it can be hilarious. There'll be one male who has that territory. There'll be several females and the male's job all day long, 24 hours a day, it seems like, is to run every other male off or any female that's not part of the original territory. So they are constantly buzzing, fighting, and uh, doing aerodynamics that would make the Blue Angels proud uh, when they're out there. Um, and so it's good medicine, but we're losing wildlife at an astonishing pace. Um, this is a, a, a little excerpt from the World Wildlife Fund's Living Planet about what's happened to 4,300 species that they monitored. A 68% decline since 1970. And then there was a report um, two years ago um, that was a joint effort by the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. And those of you who <laughs> speak in a kindergarten in Glenn School who know Clark, my son, um, he was part of that program after receiving his PhD and worked directly uh, on this project and one of the authors of the project that used um, citizen science data to demonstrate we've lost 2.9 billion birds um, since, since about the 70s, the early 70s. Um, you know, when you think about that, that's a, that's a staggering, staggering number. And then that's one of the things that kind of came to me um, a couple of years ago when these kinds of numbers were starting to, to show up. Um, and, and one of the reasons is going back to the nature deficit disorder, when you spend 90% of your time indoors, you just don't know, you know, you just don't notice these kinds of things going on. And, 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 and it is a short time period from an evol you know, um, evolutionary point of view, but from a person's point of view, it, you know, it's been slow, you know, it, it's not just happened overnight. You didn't wake up one morning and go out and you and didn't hear, you know, uh, a cardinal singing or didn't see an Eastern bluebird in your yard. And I also think, and I want to touch on this a little bit later too, that uh, 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 the boomers, um, not all boomers, obviously, but we were a generation coming out of the post-war, World War II, where we were gonna modernize and um, fix everything, you know, for our comfort and our convenience. 
and so we said about taming taming nature and the draining of the of the wetlands is a is a great example of that um and i'll talk about a few others in, in just a, a minute and uh, this is one i'm going to I'm going to gen, you know, walk gingerly about this. Um, people who did want to be aware and consume environmental news saw this as a particular problem to the big marquee species. The, the polar bears uh, get a lot of, a lot of publicity. You know, the penguins, um, you know, so the, it, the rhinos, and all of this rightfully so. You know, obviously, rightfully so. And um, I'm a big fan and David Attenborough wannabe, uh, kind of. So, you know, I understand uh, why the documentaries were done and, and the position they took and the messages they were giving. But the fact is uh, we were losing a lot of the wildlife right outside our door, you know, um, walking to the car to get in the commute to go, go downtown to work. Um, there were fewer and fewer contacts, you know, with birds and, uh, and, and other um, invertebrates. And um, I use this as an example now in some of the other presentations I do. This is an ad that came out about a mm, couple of months ago. And those of you who follow my Facebook page are familiar with this. Before the cichlids, the 17 year cichlid, uh, the brood X, could even come out of the ground, ortho was advertising a chemical to kill them, you know, it, because God forbid that they might eat some of the, the garden flowers and they're noisy. Well, again, growing up in the woods, uh, like I did in the South, I can't imagine a night without cichlid, you know, or, and Katie dids and you know, crickets and things. I mean, it just, it wouldn't be the South. And, um, and and I'll talk about this in a, in a minute too. Those uh, generally broadcast um, insecticides don't just stop with cichlids. So um, our lightning bugs or fireflies to some some of you maybe, but to me lightning bugs um, have been decimated um, in the southeast, and uh, you just don't see them. Uh, as much as, as you did just just even a few years ago, and so then then along came uh, sheltering in place, um, and all of a sudden we were home ninety percent of the time, not gone ninety percent of the time. It was quiet outside, right? I think every one of us probably at some point back then, um, spring of twenty twenty, probably made the comment about just how quiet it was. Traffic was down, leaf blowers were banned for at least a little bit. Um, people started walking. Uh, our neighborhood just became, it looked like an outdoor track. And, you know, whole families, you know, were out walking for entertainment. And people started noticing there's, there's a lot of wildlife uh, in, our, in our yards. So they got these more and more doses of nature. And it, it, some of them started very actively uh, becoming bird watchers, uh, buying feeders, binoculars, and so forth. And one of the things that struck me, and it had struck me on uh, different nature conservancy, uh, Georgia conservancy trips we take, is when people first notice uh, nature, even a, a little bit later uh, in life, that's the baseline. You know, it's like, wow, did you see that? And, and I have to bite my tongue every once in a while and say, yes, I've seen that. And I used to see lots of that. You don't, that's, actually a kind of an uncommon occurrence now. Um, and bluebirds is a good example of what we were losing at a rapid rate, but what we've gained back when citizens took notice or small numbers and actually took action, started building uh, bluebird uh, boxes and so forth and, and spread them around and bluebird populations are, are really rebounding. But uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, I was afraid that I would probably not get a chance to get a, a good shot of, of an Eastern bluebird in Georgia. So that gave me an idea. Uh, and here's a little bit of background. And again, I want to be um, a little ginger in some of what I want to say next. Um, all of a sudden, there's this soaring interest in, in, in birding and connecting back into nature. 
uh, as a way to uh, deal with, with our sheltering in place and our lockdowns. And people became aware, but climate change has become kind of all consuming and the noise around uh, the good noise and the bad noise just overwhelms some of the other environmental news that we should be just as concerned with. And in my mind, sometimes a little more concerned with because it's having um, an immediate impact and an, an impact that we can do some things right now and not wait on the, you know, the politicians to get their act were to ever happen and stop promising goals and actually start doing something right. So if you look at the bird uh, loss um, in particular, it's habitat loss is number one, far and away, um, habitat degradation. So what habitat is remaining and hadn't been put to other use uh, is not inhabitable by a lot of our wildlife. I will not touch on this about cats. That always turns into some rowdy argument that's not winnable either on Zoom or on Facebook, but they do kill 1 billion birds a year. Uh, and uh, collisions, um, collisions with buildings, particularly during fall migration when there's large numbers of birds, the new generation of birds and they're all young are heading back south. Um, a lot of them don't make it through uh, Metro, Metro Atlanta. Um, so habitat loss and degradation I want to focus on, and then they, um, they are large scale problems or global problems. Uh, and they can also be kind of like climate change. They can kind of be overwhelming if you're trying to do something of, about it personally. I mean, you know, our, our neighborhood's full of Priuses and, um, you know, uh, the other signs that people are, are listening and taking climate change serious, they were working on reducing their carbon footprint, I applaud all that. But in the meantime, um, you might have heard leaf blowers, um, two houses down, blowing every single leaf off into the street and it'll be bagged up in the landfill and not left as litter and it, that always really kind of gets to me when someone calls a natural leaf that fell on the ground um, as it's done uh, for millennia and as part of the ecosystem is litter when i walk out <laughs> walk out on um, east ponce de leon and it's full of disposable plastic uh, bags and masks and so forth now the, the real litter so Um, in, in his latest book, and as a follow on to some of his other thinking about the importance of insect lives to, to all of our lives, is that uh, green lawns, turf in the US, there's some 40 million plus acres. And when you add it up, it's the largest irrigated crop in, in the US. And um, most, most lawns uh, have a lot of ornamentals and um, non-native shrubberies. And the combination of those two are really leading to a crash, uh, a very apocalyptic crash for insects. And that is not good. And that's not as climate change moves moves ahead, that's and um, in the whole food web um, begins with with insects. And 96 percent of songbirds must have insect protein in order to feed their chicks because the chicks at that stage cannot digest uh, plant protein. And this little chickadee, um, I hope all of you are familiar with chickadees. They're a very, very common bird in our yards and, and coming to our feeders. She will feed her brood over the, the season four to 5,000 in, and the ones that really, <clears throat> 
like are caterpillars because they're already plump, juicy, and highly digestible. And one of the things um, that I would get comments on when I started posting these a, a year or so ago to our neighborhood list service, I'd get questions like, what happened to all my birds? They, they're not coming to my feeders anymore. Well, they're not coming to the feeders because they're out gathering insects as they possibly can to feed uh, to their, their nestlings. And they only periodically will come back to the feeders uh, in order to get seeds, you know, for themselves to supplement their own nutrition. So if your birds have disappeared from your feeders over the last couple months, don't worry about it. They're out there. And if you watch around underneath your trees and so forth, you'll see a lot of fledglings. There's a little family of brown thrashers back here behind me that are out. And mom does a really good job <laughs> kind of back to kindergarten they birds learn uh, from their parents uh, they learn from the male mostly on how to sing and they learn from the mom mostly um, on, on how to forage so you'll see them out there and she'll be kind of guiding them around and it's kind of trial and error i, I took a, a video the other day of this one he'd pick some up in his mouth chew it a little bit and then spit it out and go to the next one and, and put it in his mouth and spit it out until he finally found something that he liked. So real trial and error. Um, so here, here was the plan. Um, I, first of all, I would take sheltering in place seriously and, um, and, and stop traveling to some of the destinations I really like to go to bird, like Georgia's Coast. Um, I would post what I think are interesting shots uh, to my social media accounts and to the neighborhood listserv and uh, tag them birding from home so they're, they're, they're searchable. And then I would include comments on why I thought they were interesting, Maybe something about the bird's history or at that point in time, um, what the behavior they might have been exhibiting, coloration, one of my, um, I guess, most liked post about this is explaining there is no blue pigments in nature all the blue you see in blue jays and indigo bunnings so that's color um, structural color and it's it's because of the wing structure and and the nano uh, air pockets in it that refracts absorbs the um, red and orange spectrum and refracts the blue back to our eyes so when you see a blue jay you're actually looking at a brown bird um, but your brain is telling you it's, it's blue. And then I would slip in some what I consider practical do's and don'ts to make, make our yards more attractive and safer uh, for the related species. And um, hopefully not too preachy. A lot of you I, I know follow it. So I hope you don't think I've been too, too preachy about it. And um, to my son Clark's, chagrin, our family scientist, I'm not above throwing in a little cuteness uh, in here to get people's, people's attention. This is a barred out pair that's actually nesting um, two houses down in a, a really big stately oak tree. And they're in our yard, literally above the back door. Um, in courtship preening and she is helping preen his feathers, um, which is very important you know, to us. And I also think they were just taking a parent's night out from the kids too, because it was right at the height of um, when their outlets were, were growing. Um, so some practical do's and don'ts. Um, the first one, and, and Lynn, <laughs> Um, I hope I don't uh, get some of this wrong because I know this is something that you're, you're adamant about. Um, plant natives, um, they're, they're just bird attractors and they attract them for really good reasons. They're, they're high in nutrients and um, the birds uh, have evolved with them. So their digestive tracts and all of the things work together to keep keep the bird healthy. Uh, fruit um, and berries also uh, attract um, a large variety of insects um, as well that's there and available to the bird. So it's kind of like a, 
a whole foods for, for birds, a one-stop place that can go and get a lot of really good, wholesome nu nutrient food. Uh, this is a cedar wax wing on, the, uh, on my right, um, called a bobbing for service berries. They're service berry trees. The sun's blocking them. They're right behind me in that, in that bright sunlight. And when they're ripe and they, um, they're just wrapping up, the tree, I've counted 12 different species. The squirrels love them. I've even had a chipmunk up in the top of them uh, eating, eating these service berries. And one of the famous things about cedar wax wings is they'll stay on there and gorge until they can barely fly. And if the berries are really, really ripe, they'll ferment in the, in, in the cedar wax wings digestive tract. Yeah. They, they get a little tipsy and they've been they've been known to fall out of the tree um, uh, on occasion. Um, the American ro robin on a cherry lord, boy, they love they love cherry laurel. I'm, I'm and, sure. What? Um, did say. Um, American robins, I think, are underappreciated. They're actually a, a really pretty bird, uh, particularly when they're in breeding plumage. Um, number two, uh, subtract turf, add litter. Um, it, you know, it, I know everybody has different aesthetics, um, and, and I understand that and appreciate it and don't want to be too preachy. But a few islands here and there uh, around your trees, put your leaves in there for mulch. Um, just some basic things, maybe uh, a, an area in the backyard that the neighbors can't see, so it doesn't bug them. Put put your leaf pile there and not send it to the to the landfill. Put a brush pile there with it. Um, the owls hang out in my yard because there's a nice brush pile back there, and I won't tell you exactly what's being attracted and eaten back there, but um, it's not litter, and it, it, it can go a long way. Um, to helping these birds. And the white-throated sparrow that was in one of the earlier posts, we've lost 90-something million of those birds over the last few years, which is an absolute shame. They're not gorgeous, um, I think. They have one of the sweetest songs that you'll hear in, in the morning chorus. And I, I know you've all heard it, and I can't imitate it, but it's like, sweet Canada, 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 Canada. Sweet Canada, Canada. And it's just a... Gorgeous song. The Eastern Toei, um, they they spend most all their lives on the ground foraging. They got a famous two foot kick where they can kick up the litter and eat the arthropods that are that are there. And they're the one. If you've ever heard the bird out in your yard going, "Drink your tea, drink your tea," that's that's the Eastern uh, Toei. This is this is a male. I got another picture later to show you the a female. A, a, sexual dimorphism, but um, okay. Plant encouraged, particularly in public spaces, um, turf, uh, the clump grass, the native Georgia grasses. We forget the Southeast in particular was a large savanna. It, it was comparable to what we now think of uh, in Eastern Africa, you know, dominated by the long longleaf pine. 98% of it's gone. But um, Doug Ptolemy points out that if we all planted a little bit in the, fra in the fragmentation, when you added it all back up, if we just took half of our yards and put it back native and put some native grasses and did something, it, we would regain enough area to create a national park. That's, that's, the power of numbers. So we have small lots, but we have millions and millions of them. Um, this is a, a barn owl. Uh, I think one of the most magnificent creatures out there. They're just absolutely gorgeous birds. She spent uh, the spring in Legacy Park in Decatur where they have planted on a back field going back down toward the little pond back there all native clump grasses, which are just beautiful themselves uh, when, they're, when they're up and, and high. 
and she was um, eating field mice every morning. She was it was like clockwork about. 7.15 to about 8, 8.15, she'd be out just putting on a show. Uh, the zebra longwing um, butterfly, a little story behind it, that's the Florida state butterfly. And until four or five years ago, um, this happened to be the only picture, it's the first picture of a zebra longwing recorded in DeKalb County. Now, at last, uh, summer, and I suspect it'll be true this summer, we'll probably see um, five or six uh, in the yard. And this is um, evidence that with climate change, there is a real change in uh, ranges for certain species, um, resident species. I'm going to talk about the migrants a little bit later. Um, but zebra um, Long wings are, are moving north, um, like some of our bird species. Uh, lay off the insecticides and herbicides, you know, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir on a lot of this, but this is also a little bit of practice for something uh, else I'm going to do a little bit later. Um, here's everybody's favorite, the monarch. I don't probably don't have to tell any of you what's happened to the monarch populations um, over the last decade. Uh, the upper right is a painted lady, and I, I wonder if that if she really doesn't like that name with the connotations that it has. And then uh, a yellow jacket. Gee, we would have thought I would have got a yellow jacket in a in a presentation. And then the honeybee, and I think everybody's familiar with with the plight of the honeybees and the cost it has in terms of agriculture in this country. Um, do not use, do not let your landscapers use it. Encourage city officials, county, everybody you can talk to. Let's get rid of poison rodent bait. Um, the rats and things crawl off. They don't die. Or if they do die, they're picked up by um, owls and hawks. <clears throat> and we actually have a very large population of hawks um, in the Emory Decatur area. This is a broad-shouldered, or excuse me, red-shouldered hawk uh, that was nesting a couple of doors down. Um, they left in order to make room for red-tailed hawks who tend to be a, a little more aggressive, but uh, the red-shoulders are still around. You see them all the time at Clyde Shepherd uh, Nature um, Reserve. And like I said, we have at least two breeding owl pairs in our neighborhood and they are great rodent control. Um, th that's what they do. I did a post on my blog, they don't eat and kill dogs. Um, I'll get that every once in a while when I'm presenting. They don't, that, that red-shouldered hawk barely weighs two pounds. It's all feathers, 60% feathers, and it's uh, bone structure, their, their bones are hollow. So they can't lift something off the ground that weighs more than them. So the dogs are safe unless it's some little, teeny, teeny thing. Um, Lynn, <laughs> reduce plastic use, right? Um, the, the, the way plastic is impacting our environment on a daily basis, every day, is just maddening to me. Uh, I can be out in some of the most remote areas of Georgia and find a mylar balloon from a happy birthday party or a kindergarten graduation. And um, they get, they make their way to, to the wetlands. You know, they come out of the, they don't get to the landfill, but they get into the um, drainage, stormwater drainage system. They make their way to South Peachtree Creek, and, you know, on and on and on. And then they fool, you know, the, the, the wetland birds and they try to eat it, they strangle, all of the, all of the bad things that I, I know everybody um, knows. The bird on the right is one of my favorites is um, American Bitter and it's, uh, it's a pretty frequent visitor to Clyde Shepherd. Um, I think it comes back every year because it knows it's the only bitter and it knows where all the crayfish are in the little beaver pond in Clyde Shepherd. They're famous, if they get into, into the actual brown weeds or sagrass grass like down on the coast and so forth, you can't see them. And one of their tricks of camouflage is they'll hold their head straight up 
and weave with the wind, just like the, the, the reeds that are around them. You cannot see them until they move somewhere and get into something that's a little more contrasting color. Uh, that's a hooded merganser, uh, a diving duck, and they exist on um, crayfish, minnows, small small brim, and so forth. And they're, they're not a, a weed-eating duck. They, they, they rely on, uh, on fish. Uh, drink certified coffee. We like birds and beans. That's certified by the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. Makes Clark happy. Uh, we also get coffee from Cafe Cappuccino down in Americas. They're not Smithsonian certified, but uh, they sponsored Georgia Audubon. Audubon helps them select the farmers. It's all organic um, and so forth. And the reason this is important is we're talking about ecosystems. If we do everything we can right here in our backyards and across the, the continental US to help protect birds, and then they go back to their wintering grounds in Central America and to South America, some of them way down into South America, uh, like, like this uh, scarlet tanager. Um, and they're, they're not protected down there. We lose them. I mean, it, it was, it's just simple systems kind of thinking. So uh, certified uh, shade grown coffee, uh, bird friendly coffee is really important. That's a wood thrush on the bottom. Um, if you're not familiar, I hope you, everyone's familiar with the wood. If you're in the woods, particularly right at dusk and they sing, it's like hearing a flute. It is one of the most gorgeous sounds um, you'll hear in nature. Um, if you can safely do it, leave your stick up some snags. Um, one of the things that's really hurt a lot of the bird populations, like this particular this brown headed nuthatch, that when they're out, you, you might have heard them, they, they sound like a squeaky toy, or if you've got uh, your, your tennis shoes on and you're squeaking across the floor, that's the sound they make when they're calling. Um, they need cavities, and like Eastern Bluebird needs cavities. Brown-headed nuthatches aren't, they, they don't use nest boxes quite as much. They really need natural cavities. Um, in their America's or North America's smallest nuthatch, they are just a neat, neat little bird. The bird on the right is pileated woodpecker, so go to the other end, it's our largest uh, woodpecker in North America. And they can devastate a rotten log no time flat. If you've seen them out on a dead tree or on a stump on the ground, they can really go to go to town on it. Um, they they're the closest thing to watching a dinosaur still, I think, out there. All right, um, that's the the practical do's and don'ts. I'm going to spend whatever time we have left, uh, Susan, and you can just call a halt. I'm going to run through just some just some bird pictures. And most of them will be ones that are common to our feeders. Um, this is a Carolina wren, the, one of the smallest little brown jobs in the yard that has by far the biggest voice. If you hear a bird really loud in your yard singing tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, um, and you don't know what it is, guess um, Carolina wren, you're probably right. They're, and, but the problem is they also have 256 different vocalizations on that same thing. So you got to listen to rhythm and, and, and some other things, but they are loud and they are your yard's sentries. A cat's not going to come in, a you know, a stranger's not going to come in that they don't let you know it. They, they start scolding and scarking. And they're also famous for nesting in anything. I've had them nest in old boots in the garage. People talk about they'll nest over the top of their, um, porch lights, oh, they'll, they'll nest just about anywhere. Carolina chickadee is another very, very common um, bird in our yards that comes to our feeders. Uh, their song is chickadee. You, you hear chick -chick 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 chickadee. Um, they, they use this lichen and uh, other materials uh, for their nest. Um, and I was lucky to get a shot of her getting her materials. Tufted to titmouse, another uh, very common um, bird. Um, they got really special eyes. The way their eyes are situated on their head um, in, in, in the shape, and uh, they, they have a far more um, wide range of vision than most birds. And they use that 
uh, to hunt bee, uh, excuse me, insects off the bottoms of, of leaves and so forth. And you'll see them periodically up under the leaves. And if they lose their balance, they'll just flutter and fly. It's called hawking. And they are really good insectivores. Song sparrow, um, little brown job. If you see a little brown bird and it's not a Carolina wren with her tail propped up and it, it, it looks a little stubbier and a little bit bigger, it's probably a song sparrow. And they're called a song sparrow for a very good reason. They, they have a beautiful song. Their Latin name is Mel Nobody, I can't say it, Melody. Um, and um, they, they spend the spring and a lot of the summer with us. And then when it gets a little too hot, they'll, they'll move up to North Georgia and the higher elevations are a little further up in the, into the Carolina, North Carolina. Our state bird, the brown thrasher. Um, this is another bird that's gotten hurt really bad by habitat loss. They, they depend on deep shrubbery with edge lines that open into fields so they can um, come out and do their two foot kick and eat ants and spiders uh, out, of the, out of the litter. And um, they are very, when they're young in particular, they are very, very susceptible to cat predation because, of, because they spend their time on the ground. Uh, now, now how- The ground thrasher is the state bird of Georgia, if I recall from elementary school. <laughs> yes, it is. It, it, is our, it, it is our state bird. And it, matter of fact, it was school children that fought to have named the state bird. It's a, kind of a little interesting story in the 30s. And they kind of took it on their own to, to do that. And the legislature finally caught up with them. But it was a, a good example of school children just taking the reins and making something happen. Uh, the house, male house, house finches are actually invasive from California. A lot of people call them the Hollywood canary. They were bought east uh, to be cage birds because they sing. They got a delightful song. They got loose in New York City and now they're in every state uh, in the lower uh, continental U.S. And, um, and quite prolific. They're, they're doing well. They're one of the species that's doing well. As a matter of fact, most of the birds that are doing well are in fact uh, the non-natives. Uh, female ruby-throated hummingbird. The, the picture up on the right, uh, I wanted to put, remember I, I talked about how insects are so important to, to bird nutrition, even hummingbirds. 60% um, of a hummingbird's um, nutrition comes from insects. And a lot of times when you see them on the blossom, they're actually taking insects out um, and then the, in, along with the nectar. Um, and I can see it because I know where to look, but if you look where its mouth is open and pointing a little way up, you'll see a little dot that's a little, a little flying insect of some some kind that it is about to nab. And its jaws are set up so that they open at an extra angle, open wider when they're hawking uh, insects like that. It's a very interesting uh, jaw structure. Um, the bottom picture, I just wanted to show the hummingbird nest. That's lichen and other things. They weave that with their beaks with spider webs. So spiders uh, not only are a great food source, but they they provide a lot of the, they, they, the, the webs are kind of like going to Ace in town hardware uh, to pick up your building materials. American goldfinch, uh, this is a bird that fools a lot of people. This is in its uh, breeding colors and they're in their breeding colors right now, but most of the year they're very uh, dull drab and a lightish yellow, but um, a chipper little bird. Their, their song is a chirpy, chippy, chippy, chippy type of thing. They're, they're fun to hear uh, when they're out there and they're fun to see. Red-bellied woodpecker, and I got this shot and use it to demonstrate. A lot of people will say, Steve, I saw a red-headed woodpecker in my yard. That's actually kind of rare. I see them in Decatur, red-headed woodpeckers in Decatur, and you know it as soon as you see it. The entire head is just scarlet red. A lot of woodpeckers have red napes and, and, and maybe collars and so forth. The red belly woodpecker was named after, you can see, the, the red belly. And unless they're in a, a, a position like this, you would, you would not, know, not know that. This is a yellow rump warbler. Um, it's one of our most common warblers. Uh, they are almost full-time residents. They don't go back to Central America quite much. They'll go down into Mexico. So they, they, they stay around with us. And one of the reasons they can do that 
is uh, they're one of the few warblers, one of the few song warblers in particular. Most warblers are insectivores. Uh, yellow rumps, um, also called myrtle warblers here in the southeast, digestive system allows them to eat berries, myrtle berries. That's how they got their subspecies name. So they, they're they adaptable to staying here uh, in the late fall and into the winter because they can survive on the berries and aren't is they don't rely as much on the on the insect population. Here's a cedar waxwing eating a berry. Now this is a Mahonia. A lot of us have it in our yard. It was a, a plant used heavily in the 20s, 30s, 40s for ornamental landscaping because uh, it is it is pretty. The berries are pretty. They're very edible by by birds, but they're non-native. Uh, they're they're Asian orient but they are really well established. So the best thing is keep managing to get, you know, they're hard to get rid of, almost impossible to get rid of. So rather than do all that effort, just manage, you know, where they sprout up and so forth and leave them in the yards because the cedar waxwings really, really uh, love them. Uh, they, they come in. Uh, the, 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 the mockingbird, you know, the, the marquee singer, um, Although the brown thrasher will give a mockingbird a run for its money, um, but they're in just about everybody's yard or around in, in the neighbor's yard, and you know they're there because they own they own the yard in their mind. They'll they'll run anything off that they think they can run off. Here are the eastern towies. Um, again, the, the tops the male, the bottoms the, the female. This is an example of um, sexual dimorphism where they where they're different. There, the drink your tea bird. This is the downy woodpecker, um, smallest woodpecker in North America. And, and we have a lot of them uh, in the Emory Decatur area. I wanted to do the bald eagle. I haven't seen one in our yard yet, but in 1972 or so, we lost the last breeding pair of eagles in Georgia. Uh, in 1978, some captives were introduced um, and now, because of the program at DNR, the, uh, the, the nine-game status, and I hope if you have a license plate, is either uh, a nine-game license plate or a Georgia Tech license plate, um, because that money does go, and the law was changed, so it really does go now to uh, habitat restoration and other programs, and the bald eagles have really benefited from it. There are 240, 250 breeding pairs. Now this one is uh, up in Raven County on the Tallulah River um, and they had two successful fledglings this year. Um, so they're, this is a white-eyed vireo. They're a, a neotropical migrant. They come up from deep, you know, Panama in that area and come up and spend the summers with us. Um, this is a northern perilla, same thing, neotropical comes through. They don't stay around us very much, uh, but they're all over North Georgia. So those of you who are, have homes up there or go visit uh, up there, uh, they're around. They're a neat little, they're tiny, tiny little birds and they make this real uh, interesting buzzing sound. Um, but they're, they're, they're like little jewels. This is a prothanatary warbler. They're mostly in swamps uh, and, and wetlands. So they're, they're having a hard time as, as we lose more and more wetlands um, across, across the country. They're called the swamp canary uh, because of their yellow coloration and very dominant song when you're out. You'll, you hear them way before you can see them. Field sparrow, this is a very common sight out in the crown of Georgia out in, in agricultural fields. Um, this bird is sitting on a pine tree that was in the successional forest. Um, we, we need fire, you know, uh, to, to go through some of these forests. Our, our forest management programs are finally kind of coming back around, but we stopped doing uh, controlled fires and so forth, and, and DNR is back doing them. Birds need to have the undergrowth taken out. It also takes the fuel supply out so the fires don't burn as hot and different things. But from a wildlife point of view, it's very important to have forests that are different ages 
with different mixes of, of species in it and diversity in it. When you see those big stands of um, pulpwood pines, there's nothing there. It's the same thing if you go by the beautiful green cotton field, as far as I can see in winter blooming, you know, the white flowers, no wildlife. Yellow crowned night heron, I just wanted to throw in one of our coastal birds. I mentioned this in passing. Our coast is a uh, gem. Uh, you know, and you probably all know the stories about how we, uh, particularly because of Jimmy Carter's help um, when he was governor, um, we, we had the most protected marshland anywhere on, on the East Coast. And uh, we have several American Birding Association, important birding places, Little St. Simons, Little Cumberland, um, Asaba, you just go down the list. And it's an important breeding ground um, for the birds. And there's a little area called Harris Neck. And if you ever get a chance to go down there, I highly recommend it. Uh, wood storks are down there. They have a huge rookery and wood storks are threatened on the endangered species. You can go there and see them by, by the dozens, along with all of the herons and, and all of the acres. It's, it's just a really special place. And you can see painted bunnings, which is probably singularly the most beautiful songbird that, that visits us in the U.S. This blue grosbeak, another uh, bird that visits uh, and spends the summer with us, particularly up in North Georgia. And I put this one in, this is a color. There is not a blue feather anywhere on that bird. Uh, this is the red hawk pair I was talking about. Red-tailed hawks are doing pretty good in the urban area. You know, we have lots of dumps and trash cans and different things that attracts a lot of stuff and a lot of food waste to get through all sorts of stuff. That, that helps um, the prey population. And you, you'll see red-shouldered hawk sometimes driving down ponds. You'll also see Cooper's hawk. There was a Cooper's hawk that used to stay down near manuals um, all the time. And I'm gonna wrap up, it's, it, it's one. Um, I wanted to put this in there. Belted kingfishers are my nemesis bird. I have spent years chasing these guys and gals. They, their eyesight is, unbelievable i mean uh keen-sighted uh, and um just everything awareness you you can't sneak up on them um you have to go and i set up almost like a blind and sit there and and i finally got a shot close to what i've been looking for is when they come out of the water with the with the fish in their mouth you've probably seen it on on nova and some of the other documentaries where it's a favorite nature photography shot of the kingfisher coming out of the water and the fishes in its mouth and you know everything that's 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 one of my goals is to get that and I, I came a little close on this one but um there's there's a lot of them around now they're coming back um as the water gets cleaner and uh, bait fish gets populations kind of come back um they're, they're coming back as well. And this is on the Tallulah River as well below Burton, Lake Burton Dam. And the water there is getting cleaner, but on the lake side, because everyone is putting in turf lines uh, and fertilizing it, the last few summers we've had this huge algae bloom on Burton and our, like we have a house on down seed the next lake down and grass and so forth. It, uh, growing and it's really changing. It's it's really changing the, the lakes and, and the ecosystems, and it's really infuriating me. And I, and I don't mind you recording this. It, it just drives me nuts when people go to the mountains and take the suburbs with them. You know, they, they take down all the trees, take out the natives, take down the rhododendron, and plant soja. You know, or, and right down to the water, you know, water line, and then they, you know, and they put in non-native non flowering plants. Right? Um, it, it it really has an impact on on the entire ecosystem. Well, Susan, that's an hour. Uh, Gosh, it's amazing, Steve. Uh, your talent in capturing these moments. So, but I bet we at least have a few questions for those who can give us a few more minutes. If you have a few more minutes to Steve, Steve. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, off the top of my head, I, I want to ask, like, for a shot like this, like, how long were you out there to get this shot? And how many did you have, you know, 70 
clicks and then you got this one or what's a typical what's a typical photo take as far as your time out there um this one i was probably um on the bank a couple of hours and um my my camera has a feature that I can burst shoot. So when I hold the shutter down, uh, my camera is pretty fast. I can get 18 frames per second. So um, this day, I probably shot somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 frames. Wow. That's amazing. So other questions like that of the group of kind of, I mean, you're just a wealth of information of the birds themselves and the environmentalism and then just the beauty that you capture is amazing. So any other questions of folks of how to get into this so that you can join the the birding group <laughs> groupies? <laughs> Thank you, Steve. That was awesome information, awesome pictures. And um, I'm not sure whether I should be glad you called me out twice or what. But <laughs> I, felt, I, I felt like, um, I was stepping on your ground a little bit, you know. No, I, no. But you know, I I, I really am in <laughs> awe of what the environmental committee, you know, and the, the stances to take, particularly on the on the reduce. Um, I try to explain to people that if we replace, even if we replace fossil fuel based. Um, fuels, you know, gasoline and so forth with uh, renewables like wind, that still has environmental issues we got to deal with because of the sheer volume of what of the energy we consume, right? And so when I was talking about uh, bird deaths, this is a touchy subject, right? The, the number of bird deaths around wind turbines is going up. And um, you know, more wind turbines and, and so forth. And there's some of them that are just being put in some really bad places. There's some places off um, in the Atlantic coast up near New Jersey. One of the, the biggest destination migratory, migratory birds on the East Coast is Cape May, New Jersey. The ones that come up the, the coastal flyway, a lot of shore, shore birds and so forth. And um, they're, they're running into several wind turbine farms on the way up. There's technologies that can mitigate some of that and policy. But it's back to the point. People get so consumed with the carbon footprint and so forth. And they're not always familiar with the fact that we lost 3 billion birds. Because when they walk outside, like right now, there's a Brown Thrasher clicking over in the, in the service berry tree. You know, for, for a lot of people, that, boy, that's great. Look at all the birds. You know, we've lost almost 50% of the brown thrashers since 1966 um, to, to these kinds of issues. So, it's a long, long answer, maybe probably a little too emotional, that the Glenn Environmental Committee stance on reduce. Uh, I think is exactly the message. Steve, heard. Steve, yes. um, I was interested in your comments on the cherry laurels. Uh, I experienced them as being invasive, and I read somewhere that they're poisonous for animals. But you say they're they they feed birds. Yes, and and, and there are some species of laurel uh, that this was the Carolina and the native one. There are some some common named plants, you know, common named laurels that are actually not in, in that genus, um, and they are they, they they can take over. They if they find a nice place, they, they will go. They got to be uh, well managed, and, and when the birds poop, you know, oftentimes it's right on top of your car, right? So. Uh, <laughs> They, they need to be controlled. The one that uh, people, uh, that is truly poisonous, particularly to see the wax wings in any volumes is Nandina. And Nandina is another one that's really hard to get rid of because it's so, so well established. 
So the idea with Nadinia, and this is a good time of the year to do it, you can see the berries just starting to come out. Just take your clippers and go clip them all off. Don't let them, don't let them get ripe. And um, so you can keep them as shrubbery and, and it, you don't hurt the birds. But Nandinias are toxic to cedar wax weeds in, in volume. And you didn't, you did not show any pictures of the great blue heron who visits my yard and is not particularly welcome. <laughs> Does he eat the coin? Right. Yeah, they, yeah, um, you know, you probably have tried all the, you know, the owl things. Right. <laughs> yes. But, you know, there, there, I, I was fishing down on the Chattahoochee a few, a few weeks ago, and um, there was a great blue heron down there was famous. Um, during one part of the season, the Chattahoochee was catch and release only, and this great blue heron was sitting right on the point of this island that was a known hotspot for catching stock trout and would come and try to get the trout off your hook. It was <laughs> that brazen. <Believe> it. <laughs> And um, friends of mine, there, there's one that hangs out at Clyde Shepherd, and I, had, I almost put one in, Cindy, <laughs> because um, guy goes over there and gorges on on the crayfish, and I've gotten several fish. In that. Um, the other bird I and I just thought of I didn't do, and is the blue jay. Uh, blue blue jay. A lot of people have a love hate affair with blue jays. Matter of fact, there's one calling right now that, um, you know, they're bullies, you know, come and run everybody off. And I have one in the yard that does a great uh, red tailed hawk imitation and does a great Cooper's imitation. And he will come sit on the feeders and do his Cooper's hawk imitation to keep the other birds away. And I think he just does it for people. But, but they are also uh, one of our most. Uh, important birds in that oak trees are the base of all our forests. Oak trees, they're, they're, that's a whole topic in and of itself. And <clears throat> blue jays cache acorns and they'll cache them over about a one acre area. And, um, you know, they, they'll put them in the ground in about a one acre. They remember where every single one of those are. And the ones that they don't eat, sprout and that's how uh, oak trees spread across our our forest uh, blue jays uh, disperse their seeds you know and, and by the way that's part of the cherry laurel problem too right is you get up and eat them i got a picture i didn't put in i should have put in of a robin squishing uh, a service berry in a <laughs> right so um, you know good and bad but you know it, it's fun to watch them and then just get a shovel and dig up the cherry laurels that jump up. Right. Well, if um, if you don't, if you didn't get his websites earlier, how you can follow on Instagram and then some on Facebook, and then his um, your website is just rushing outdoors. Is that right? Is that rushing dot outdoors. net? Dot net rushingoutdoors.net. So definitely check it out and follow Steve's birding. And thank you. Um, if you haven't seen, sometimes on Zoom, you can unmute and clap if you want, or do a little clapping, waving hands now for Steve. <laughs> but thank you. I'm, I'm glad you uh, spent your afternoon listening to me. I, I tend to ramble. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. Thank